Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. It's great to have you joining us this bright and sunny Sunday morning. Uh, we're just about to get underway, so if you want to move on in and find your socially distanced seats, um, you can shuffle those around as you need to. But uh, welcome. It's great to have you part of our church and joining us this morning. So please feel free. Keep coming on in and grabbing a seat. And we're going to get underway. Uh, if you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been in the book of Daniel. And Daniel is one of those books where uh, we see lots of things about God, but we also see uh, Daniel's response uh, to the law of the land um, in various ways, in various forms. Uh, and so I would thought uh, I would start our time this morning by reading just a little section uh, from Psalm 19 which, uh, verses 7 to 11, which talks of uh, God's amazing law. Um, and uh, it might be helpful for you to uh, see that in comparison uh, with the law that Daniel is required to or requested to follow and how he stands up uh, for God's law in all of that. Uh, so from Psalm 19, it says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold. They are more pure than gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Uh, I'm going to open our time together uh, in prayer uh, as we begin our time uh, in the Word and in fellowship this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your law. And we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the freedom that we have in Australia to uh, read it, uh, to gather around it, um, and to practice it without persecution. Lord, I pray that you help us uh, to encourage each other today uh, and reflect on the challenges from your word uh, so that as we go out and live out our daily lives, um, we'll be winning those around us uh, for the sake of the gospel. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Good job, ladies and gentlemen and kids of many ages. Well done. Uh, it is interesting that uh, today we do, uh, as the kids go out, we, not right now, but in a minute, um, we get to look at Daniel's bravery from Daniel chapter 6. So can I encourage you kids um, on the car trip home, chat to mum and dad and say, hey, how did Jan Daniel show his bravery today? Um, as we switch into the next part of our service, uh, I just wanted to to remind us um, about uh, the mission we have here. <clears throat> and there were three simple words that I like to remind us about. They are connect, growing, and serving. <clears throat> One of the great ways to connect with each other is Sunday mornings, and it's great to see so many people here with us. Um, but sometimes you might think, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday come along and Sunday seems so far away. Another great way to connect uh, is through growth groups during the week. Um, and so we're just going to have a little interview to spotlight growth groups so I'm going to invite uh, Chloe and Kim up to the front. Good morning. My name's Chloe, and, um, and I've roped lovely Kim into coming up for an interview this morning because I think that she is the poster child of growth groups, <laughs> which she just loves me calling her. <laughs> um, so, Kim, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Um, I'm Kim, and I feel like there's a lot of people that I haven't met. <laughs> so, um, and um, I've, my family is... Um, Ben, my husband, and I've got two kids, um, Amelie, that's three, and Elijah, who's about six months. And um, my work is at Newcastle Uni, doing a um, neuropsych PhD, so I'm a brain science nerd. So, so she shares interesting facts with us. Um, Kim, do you want to tell us about how you got connected in a growth group? Um, we hadn't been coming to the church for very long, and Fee Reed invited me along um, and mostly I was looking for friends. I think she could see that as well. So, yeah. so how did it get uh, you, help you to feel comfortable coming to church each week, being part of a growth group? 
Um, we hadn't been going, we hadn't been part of a church for a little while. Um, and when we moved to the Hunter Valley, that was one of our big things. We thought as a family, we wanted to really make sure we got connected into a church. And I was really scared being in groups of Christians. <laughs> it, really, it really, really made me nervous. And um, being in a growth group helped. Um, I was terrified the first time I went to um, but that just helped sort of ease me in and it was more getting to know people and like learn again that Christians weren't so scary. <laughs> um, so, and then just having friendships and Christian friendships and being, I've forgotten the question now, sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and it's praying with people um, and I think being with a group that was praying um, and genuinely seeking God um, makes a big difference to making friends as well. So. Um, so you kind of started to answer the next one was, how has being part of a growth group helped grow your relationship with God? Um, it's been a huge, a huge part of um, just re helping my faith, I think. I was um, really struggling, I think, before that. And, um, yeah, it's really helped me reading the Bible again and just talking to God again. And it's, I feel it's really important for my kids as well. Like, Amelie, so the kids come along and we have some amazing women that look after all the kids each week so that we can not be so distracted while we're doing Bible study. And it's become part of our weekly routine as well. And Amelie loves going along um, too. And so I feel like for setting an example for her as well, it's a big, a big thing. Um, but, yeah, it has, it has helped a lot. And I think, yeah, they're the big things. I think just getting reading the Bible again. Yeah. Um, and can you tell me, um, how in your growth group do you serve each other? Um, I feel like I haven't served anyone at all in the group there. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, um, it's been amazing to be served so much. I've never, I don't think I've ever experienced that before. Um, just, I, we've needed a lot as a family the last year or so. Um, and to know that there are people that are actually praying for me. So when um, we share prayer points, I know that the other women in the group are actually praying. Um, it's not just a lip service thing. Um, and that's a big that's a big service like for people to take time out of their day and out of their um, prayer time to pray for our family. Um, meals. We've had people, like when Elijah was born, everyone organised a, a roster system and cooked meals for like a month for our family. But then even outside of that, at times when we've been struggling, um, friends have just turned up with meals. Um, and there was one week, I think I'd shared at Bible study that I was just really struggling after Elijah was born. And someone came and visited me every day. It got to the point where I thought everyone had been in touch and organised it. But they hadn't, people were just showing up with coffees and coming to check in and hold Elijah. And um, yeah, I feel, and the women that look after our kids, like they service amazingly every Tuesday. So it's been a real um, example to me and I've been really, really blessed just by all the, um, everything that everyone's done to serve me. So I hope that I can do something as well. So. Thank you. Can you give Kim a clap? Um, so when you came into church today, you will have been given this handout with growth groups. Um, Kim's part of one of the growth groups, the Tuesday morning growth group, which is a growth group for young mums. And as she mentioned, um, one of the older ladies' growth groups blesses us each week. They've put together a roster where they come and look after our kids. And so um, them serving us means that um, the young mums in this church can sit at Jesus' feet each week and read the Bible, which is such a huge blessing. But um, I know that everyone here isn't a young mum, and I'm 
Um, so if you have a look at the sheet, there's lots of different growth groups for different ages, um, for men, for women, for um, mixed groups. And we really want to encourage you to think about joining a growth group because the motto for our church is connect, grow and serve. And being part of a growth group will help you get connected with people in church each week. Um, it will help you grow in your relationship with others and you will be able to bless each other. And also just by serving each other, Kim said she doesn't serve, but she really does because she is a person who will send messages throughout the week encouraging people and caring for each other in her service and we all have different ways that we can serve each other. So have a look. The people's names are on there and their phone numbers and I encourage you to think about um, joining a growth group. Awesome. Thank you. There's some other ways in which we can connect uh, through church and they've got, I've got lots of little pieces of paper. Um, so... I'll try not to miss any out. Um, if you are new or newish uh, and we don't have your details yet, there's a form like this. I may have collected the last one. Um, so you'll need to introduce yourself to me after church. Um, then I can write your details on the card and hand that in. Um, and next week there might be some more copies of that flying around. Uh, there was the white one that Chloe was referring to with growth groups. Uh, that looks like this. Uh, there's plenty of those going around or in the foyer. Uh, if you want to ask any questions about that, um, have a chat to um, Neville or Steve or Chloe can ask you answer any questions around that. Um, there is a men's event coming up this month as well uh, for the guys and um, kids in this church to connect and that is um, this amazing postcard looking thing with a guy hanging off a wall. All right. Um, we might try both hands when we're climbing. He looks like he's pretty good. He's only got one hand on the wall. A um, couple of pieces of information. It's 27th of March. 8.30 in the morning to 10.30. Uh, PCYC you do need to be a member of, and it will be heaps easier on the morning if you have already signed up online and just become a member. Um, putting 20, 30, 40 people through membership in the morning, we may run out of that two-hour time slot of actual climbing time. Um, so if I can encourage you, if you're coming along, to do that. Uh, and the last one is there is a high T... Um, option for women in May. Uh, so 22nd and 23rd of May, it's a little one that looks like this. Um, I'm going to suggest if you want more information, uh, chat with Liz and Bronnie about that. Um, one of my other plugs regularly when I get up is around us serving each other. And so massive thanks to those people in our church community who do regularly serve us. Um, one of the unseen ones, although you notice it when it's not done well, um, is the AV stuff. Anything visual in fact the mic's still working there's stuff on the screen i'm thankful that other people are organizing that each week and that it goes really well and we do actually need some more volunteers so um that it's not just tony and a couple of his other helpers every week so can i encourage you um next sunday morning at 8 30 he would like to do an induction and a bit of training for people who would like to join that roster um you don't need to be too technically savvy um Tony has all the skills and he will show you how to make that all function really well. Um, <clears throat> catch him after after church. He'll be up the back. Um, maybe let him know you're coming. That'd be great if we can get some more people on that roster. So it is time now uh, for the kids to head out. So if you have somebody who is uh, younger-ish in age, um, primary school and below, you might want to head out to your groups. Um, whilst the kids are doing that, can I encourage you to do two things? Uh, have a look around, say hello to somebody around you, uh, and grab your Bible and find Daniel chapter 6, because I'll be reading from that uh, in just a few minutes or seconds. Let's go with 60 seconds. All right, the calm has entered the room, which probably means the children have left. Um, so good job for distributing them to other locations around the stadium. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 6, as I said today. Uh, titled Daniel in the Lion's Den. So if you can have that with you, uh, follow along as I read, or it might be up on the screen. And um, after that, I'll pray for us and our community, and then um, Steve will get up and speak to us. So from Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. 
Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional uh, qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps uh, went as a group to the king and said, uh, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays uh, to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. Uh, he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your kingdom, um, sorry, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring uh, and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. May God... Uh, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and when uh, Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. At the king's commands, um, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in, and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear <coughs> and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel uh, from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Um, I'm just going to pray for us uh, and our church. Uh, I'm also going to commit um, the financial support that members of our church give regularly uh, to the work here. Um, for those of you that are new, uh, we want to welcome you as our guests, but for those um, regular members of church, um, can I encourage you to be uh, in prayerful thought around that? Each of our situations are different, particularly through this tricky COVID time, um, but can I pray uh, that we each um, sacrifice according to our ability in that regard? Um, and I know that as Daniel prayed to our God and God 
uh, heard his prayers, so God hears our prayers. So let's pray together this morning. Um, We'll commit all of those things to God and to Steve and his message to us as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you are a God, the maker of heavens and earth, uh, that you hold all things in your hand. Um, It is by your hand and by your word that we exist, that we are, that we have. Um, All of this is from you. And Lord, we pray that it is for your glory as well. Lord, for those gifts that we have given um, to you in the use uh, through the church here, uh, we pray that many people will be reached um, for the gospel, not only here in Cessnock, uh, through our meeting together, uh, through our witness in the community, but also more broadly. We thank you for those uh, Christian workers who are working in persecuted areas, uh, in the persecuted church, uh, where they do not have the freedom, uh, where they may be operating more like Daniel than we are uh, here today. Well, we pray for them. We pray for strength and wisdom. We pray that they continue to be prayerful um, and centered around your word, Lord, and we pray for that as us as well today. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that Steve can bring a message freely to us, that we can sit under it. Um, And Lord, we pray that we are molded and shaped by your word um, and through your spirit today. And we pray this in the mighty name and for the sake of the glory of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to welcome Steve up this morning uh, to share from Daniel 6. So you've got a big decision to make. How are you going to make the right choice. What are you going to do that's going to help you make that correct choice? Have a chat to someone around you for, let's give it 20 seconds. How do you make the right big choices? Okay, hope you've got a plan there. We see here in Daniel chapter 6, as Phil read out, that Daniel had a big decision to make. And it was really about whose law will he obey. He had to choose between obeying the law of the Most High God, who said, you must have no other gods before me, or obeying the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Choices have consequences. Choosing to obey God meant facing an agonizing death as lions ripped you limb from limb. Choosing to obey the law of the Medes and Persians meant that you are praying to the king which meant acknowledging him as a God or as the God. And that will lead to comfort, staying alive, a career promotion and greater power and authority, the uh, promotion that would come with it. So there's a lot at stake here for Daniel. He had to make a big decision but it was also a fairly simple decision, as we saw it was the other week, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego facing the, uh, the fiery furnace. It was simple in that there was not many factors to weigh up to consider. It really comes down to who is God? Whose law do I obey? I don't think Daniel made the choice about putting God first in everything and obedience to him always about whose law he was going to obey. On that day, he was arrested. He was arrested for praying. He may have made that decision way back when he was a boy in Jerusalem. He may have made that as him and all his fellow exiles trudged that 1,500 kilometers through the arid landscape between Jerusalem and Babylon and the months that that would have taken. But we do know that he made that choice as a teenager before chapter 1, verse 8. You'll remember 
where he resolved, he determined not to defile himself by eating the food from the king's table. But now the stakes are so much higher and his life is directly on the line. Whose law would he obey? What would he choose? In verse 10, you'll see that Daniel went home to his upstairs room, as was usual, where the windows were open towards Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. And we read, just as he had done before. Just as he had done for years. If we could ask Daniel how he came to make the right big decisions, he might say by making lots of right small decisions, by putting God first each day, just as I had done before. Whether a big decision or a small decision, the basis for every decision is to put God first by obeying him and choosing what will honour him irrespective of the consequences. That was Daniel's motto. Choice we all make today for God or for something else will most likely be the same choice we make when under greater pressure. As Jesus said, those who are faithful in the small things will be faithful in the bigger things. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We just ask that you will help us understand your word. We thank you, Lord, for the great example of Daniel. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word throughout the centuries for us. We ask, Lord, we might learn how he prioritized you and how you strengthened him. In your name, amen. If you've got your Bibles open there, uh, that would be great. Darius the Mede had gotten rid of Belshazzar the Babylonian, as we ended last week. He's setting up his new administration by appointing 120 satraps to rule over different regions of his empire. And over these satraps, he placed three administrators, one of whom was Daniel. These satraps were local government officials, as it were, responsible for collecting tax, keeping law and order, and probably maintaining the roads and the bridges. I don't know. They were accountable to the three administrators so that the king, you see there in verse 2, might not suffer loss. Daniel has so distinguished himself among these administrators and the satraps that the king planned, we see there, to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, in preventing the king suffering loss, he may well have put in place measures to stop the corruption, the rorting, the backhanders, whatever, and other injustices that seem to go on in most places. Now, I imagine the king would have welcomed this because he was not suffering loss. But perhaps not the satraps or the administrators if they were profiting from it. So it's possibly that, but we also see with a huge dose of jealousy mixed in, and that's why in verse 4, the other administrators and satraps try to find something to charge Daniel with. But no matter how hard they dig to try and find dirt on him, there is none. Daniel was diligent and completely trustworthy. 
And so they finally say in verse 5, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. It's very interesting, isn't it? Daniel's devotion to the Lord God was well known throughout the government and by the king. According to these corrupt schemers, this was his weak point. You see, they knew that if they could orchestrate a situation where Daniel had to choose between obedience to his God and obedience to the king's law, they knew he would choose God. That was the whole basis of their evil plan because they knew Daniel's devotion and his integrity meant that he would choose God's law, not the law of the Medes and Persians. Just a, a footnote to digress here. There's a spiritual principle here that the world does not get. Okay, it's this. I am the best employee when I honour God before my work. Daniel was so good at his job because he chose to put God first, which meant God could bless what he was doing. I am the best husband and parent when I love God more than my wife and children. You see, if I get that wrong, if I get that the wrong way around, these people that I love or these things or this job can slowly and subtly get ahead of God, which means they have become an idol. And that is something that God cannot bless. So these schemers in the government propose a law that will put Daniel in conflict with the king. Not because of anything that Daniel's done wrong in terms of corruption or negligence. There was nothing to see there. But because of his beliefs, because of his conscience. And so in verses 6 and 7, we see that they ingratiate the king, they appeal to his pride, and they lie to him about saying that all the administrators and prefects agree. No, Daniel wasn't there. They also may have argued possibly that it was good political move that uh, all these former Babylonians now acknowledge the Medo-Persian Empire and therefore unify the country by praying to Darius. After one month, the people could then resume their usual worship. It wasn't too onerous. And it doesn't really matter, does it, in a relativistic world where you can have this God or that God, whatever. And so without consulting Daniel, Darius goes ahead and makes the decree. We see in verse 9. But when Daniel hears that he must now pray to Darius alone for a month, what does he do? What does he choose? He goes to his room and prays to God, just as he had always done. He would open the windows that faced Jerusalem because Daniel lived for all that Jerusalem stood for. Daniel knows that God has not finished with Jerusalem or his chosen people. Daniel's enemies, who knows, they have seen him through the window, uh, come round and knock on the door. Daniel could have closed the window shutters. He would have had ample time to get off his knees and stand as his servant would have answered the door. But Daniel had nothing to hide. Daniel let himself be found. 
And so in verse 12, they all run back to the king and dob Daniel in. Did you not publish a decree about praying to you or being thrown into the lions? And so Darius declares the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Well, Daniel the exile pays no attention to you, it's a lie, uh, or to the decree that you have put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Well, that bit was true. We see here that the king is greatly distressed. He thought so highly of Daniel that he was just about to make him the prime minister over the whole empire. And so we see that he makes every effort until sundown to save him. And that evening, now for the third time, these determined bureaucrats turn up on the king's doorstep. Remember, Your Majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. The king realizes that these schemers had entrapped Daniel, but also they'd entrapped him. By his own silly law, because of their jealousy and his pride. But he also realized, no doubt, that he had been done over. He'd been manipulated, he'd been lied to, and he'd been duped. But he had no choice, so he gave the order to have Daniel thrown into the lion's den. But Darius calls out to his trusted advisor as he's being lowered into the pit, May your God whom you serve continually, rescue you. That night the king doesn't want to eat, he doesn't want to be entertained, and he can't sleep. So at first light he hurries to the den and he calls out in an anguished voice, we see there in verse 19, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Isn't that word? Even Darius uses that word continually. He always did it. Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done any wrong by you, your majesty. For Darius, Daniel's survival demonstrates that he is not guilty. But Daniel makes it clear that he was found innocent in God's sight. Daniel speaks what Darius is thinking. There is a higher law. There is a higher judge. There is a higher power operating here. God's law transcends any human law and God's judgment is superior to any human court. Through the book, we see that if Daniel and his friends had gone with the flow if they had followed popular opinion or done what was pragmatic to save their lives, they would have been obeying laws which sooner or later will become history, just human laws, while disobeying the higher everlasting law of God. Daniel's enemies certainly had the right strategy, though, didn't they? They'd, they'd almost succeeded. They just didn't count on a real living God who hears prayers, who loves his people, and who acts supernaturally on their behalf, unlike their gods, 
What were their gods last week? Gods of wood and stone and metal that can't see or understand. The king has these conspirators and their families thrown into the lions. Why their families? So there could be no second generation to seek revenge. Darius writes this decree to all the nations of the peoples in his empire that they must fear God, reverence him, reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and, earth, in the heavens and on the earth he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Daniel chose each day to exclusively worship and obey the Lord, working hard to improve the culture that was hostile to him, that surrounded him. He did both things. He obeyed God, but worked hard for the empire that he was part of at that time. But it was that that made him a target. And it's been pretty much the same through history. 500 years later, odd, it's the Roman Empire, where you could worship any god. It didn't really matter. There were plenty to choose from. As long as you were prepared to also join in the worship of the empire when required. The emperor, sorry, when required. The Christians could not, so they would not. And so many of them were thrown to the lions and the gladiators in the Colosseum. You see, the problem with Christianity is this, that the Lord Most High our God is not just another God, as the relativists would want us to believe. Remember a few weeks ago, remember that the Christian worldview begins with the transcendent, all-powerful, self-existent I am God. That's where it starts. And then he creates. Let's call it the box. Everything's in the box. Time, matter, space, history, everything. But he was there before the box. He'll be there after the box. He is absolute over the box. He's absolute in creation, absolute in holiness and in truth. And what's the opposite of absolute? Relative. So a relativistic world can't handle an absolute truth. It denies it and then it can start to even hate it. And this is where we are today. It's this climate that has brought about the recent legislation in Victoria. I was just saying to Phil earlier, I want to raise this stuff and make you aware about it but I'm a bit over-preaching about it as well. <laughs> but one, one last time, because it, it was fascinating to look at, 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 at the, make the comparison here. As I thought about this passage through the week, I was staggered by how many similarities there were, or there are, between 538 BC Babylon and 2021 AD Melbourne. Like Daniel, Christians in Victoria are going against the flow of their culture and will have to choose between obeying God or, by, or to obey the state. Like Daniel, for the first time in this country's history, a law has been designed to put Christians in that position of choice. 
Like Daniel, it was planned to create an issue when one did not really exist. Like Daniel, prayer is the issue specifically written in the legislation. Thou shalt not pray with people about certain topics. Like Daniel, it was invented to target a particular group in society. Like Daniel, it's essentially an issue of belief and conscience. Like Daniel, we have a higher law and a higher judge to obey first because he is the one that is our ultimate judge. Daniel said as he was being raised from the pit of lions and he judges justly and we know Thank God he also offers mercy. Like Daniel, the penalty is disproportionate to the crime. So if a person could be a Christian, comes to a Christian pastor or to a growth group leader or to someone else in their church, and they say, I'm struggling with, say, unwanted same-sex attraction. Can we talk about it? And so the pastor says, sure, and they, or the growth group leader, or perhaps just one of you. And so you meet up with that person. You hear their story, what's, what's going on and how they got to this place. And so you open God's word and you look at relevant passages about homosexuality and about God's exclusive design for sex being between a man and a woman within marriage alone. And you discuss that and you pray about that together. If that person who came to the pastor, say, told one of their friends about that meeting. That friend, that other person could make an anonymous complaint. The government will investigate the pastor, the growth group leader or the person. It'll bring them before a tribunal and could find them up to $200,000 or up to 10 years in jail and then make them go through a government re-education program to teach them what they should believe about sexuality and gender. See, I thought we were outraged about what China's doing with the Uyghurs. Peter Comensoli, the Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne, reflects the resolute tone of the churches in Victoria when he says, the government will not tell me who I can pray with and what I can pray about. Murray Campbell uh, does, a, does a great blog. He's the pastor of Mentone Baptist Church in Melbourne. And he writes, what do we do when good is defined as bad? What is a godly reaction to a society that formally deems Christian beliefs as wrong? How can we respond to a government when a government makes illegal practices that have been part of the Christian religion since the beginning of the church and have their foundation in the teaching and example of Jesus Christ? What happens when people of faith are prohibited by law from praying and speaking in line with our Christian beliefs even when people come to us for help. This legislation was condemned by the, the rather, let's say, progressive Victorian Law Reform Society, by the Victorian Doctors, by the Victorian Psychologists Association, even by gay, lesbian and feminist groups that say it's denying people the choice to access help that they may want. 
Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner Kristen Hilton says, the Commission intends to use the full range of its new powers to investigate church groups and other organisations engaged in gay conversion practices, including seizing documents and pursuing them in court if they do not comply with orders. The Andrews government gave the Commission wide-ranging powers. The Commission will not be shy about using them. Just the other way. This was just in the Melbourne uh, Age newspaper last week. Peter Comensoli and Murray Campbell both have chosen to take the Daniel option, as have many of the pastors and Christians in Victoria. What's the Daniel option? Well, to pray and to do what they have always done, irrespective. Daniel had to choose. The Christians in Rome had to choose. Our brothers and sisters in Victoria are making the choice today. And I think sooner or later, we too will have to make a choice. How will we make that right choice when so much is at stake? $200,000, that's your house. It was the daily choice that Daniel made to prioritise God, to set time aside in his busy schedule, to pray three times a day and to read the scriptures. That created, that choice to do that each day created a habit and it was that habit that strengthened Daniel each day. And it was the strength he received from that habit each day that allowed him to make the bigger choices for God. And the pressure was on because he made the small choices each day. I, I recently heard two pastors, a uh, good tip on a great podcast, Phil, thanks. And, and these guys were leaders in the emergent church. I don't know if you heard of them. It's, that's even sort of history now. But they were doing all the, the good and the trendy things in the church movement. They contextualized church. They did church in the pub. They, they were out there doing all this really cool stuff. And, and they sat together and they're reflecting on those experiences and, and some of the tough times and good times they had through that. And they realized that there was no silver bullet that was going to crack open a hostile culture for Jesus. It's just not there. They tried all the trendy things. And they're sitting there discussing that they have now come to the realization that the Bible says about the old paths, <laughs> the old roads, that the most important thing is to disciple people in prayer and reading the Bible to grow in their faith. And that is what will sustain them against the flow of culture, which is getting stronger and stronger, pushing us back. And it's that will allow us not to be sucked in. Myself and Neville would love to have a chat and help anyone establish that routine in their lives. Have a chat to us after the service you'd like. So it seems that Daniel knew all about that. And it was that, that, that simple stuff, prayer, reading, time with God, that he chose to do two and a half thousand years ago. That sustained him against the flow. It will also sustain us. Those who hope in the Lord 
will renew your strength. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the simple example of Daniel. Simple disciplines, simple routine, simple habit that had powerful consequences that fed him, that sustained him, that blessed him. And when the pressure was on, he would do the same just as he had always done, by putting you first. Lord, help us, Holy Spirit, come and move in us, that we will have the desire to do the very same thing sustain Daniel. Thank you. Uh, so there's a couple of, I guess, challenges from what Steve said this morning. Uh, and I was thinking myself as Steve was talking, uh, but surely that's like that's an Old Testament thing that's been done away with since Jesus. Life should be easy and roses. Um, and I stumbled across Acts chapter 5, verse 27, um, which says, The apostles were brought and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. That's the name of Jesus, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. This isn't a new position we're in. Um, and as it goes through to tell the story of the apostles, um, speaking of Jesus' name in Acts chapter 5, um, there's a comment in verse 39 that says, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. Uh, you will only find yourselves fighting against God. Um, and so I guess as we go out and we're challenged to think about, I guess, the way in which our society is changing, um, there was a clear, I guess, reminder from Kim this morning about the essential nature of gathering together, of being encouraged, um, and getting into God's Word and supporting each other in prayer, um, because it's those things that will, will endure us and God's Spirit in us that will equip us uh, to take these difficult stands as we need to. Uh, so I'm encouraged by you being here, and I hope uh, you're encouraged by each other joining together as we meet each Sunday. Uh, so I'll invite you back next Sunday so we can continue in, in, encouraging each other. Uh, I'd also invite you to inquire about our growth groups during the week um, because as we support each other in prayer and in community and service, um, that will uh, help us to stand for the name of Christ uh, in everything that we do every day of the week. So God bless you. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you back here next Sunday.